Um, this is, in case you want to make sure you're in the right place, this is the session on digital collections and institutional repositories, part one. Um, I'm Nancy Falgren. I'm the senior metadata librarian at the National Library of Medicine, and I'll be facilitating the session. We're going to have two presentations, and then um, they'll run about 20 minutes each, and then we'll take questions on both presentations at the end. Um, <laughs> so let's just um, jump right in. Um, the first presentation is by Xi Ying Mi and Robert Bernardi from the University of South Florida, Tampa. Um, Xi Ying is a metadata librarian at the University of South Florida, Tampa. She's focused on digital collections, metadata creation, and curation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, her research interests lie primarily in linked open data, metadata, and data management. Um, Richard is a digital collections system administrator and software developer for digital scholarship services at the university. Um, he is the digital collections um, repository administrator and also provides server, database, and application administration. He supports digital collection production and oral history program workflows. And whenever possible, Richard works on software development, including cross-department projects. Okay. Um, thank you, Nancy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, is this clicker working? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, in one cell, subject headings for 650A fields, 
uh, what I did was I uh, broke down the um, hierarchy structure of the um, Library of Congress uh, subject heading. So give each term its own style. And the 651, uh, for example, um, Eber CD, Tampa, Florida, in the printer days, that's a very popular term in this um, collection. And what I did was I break this term down into three geotermists, Eber CD, Tampa, and Florida. And they stay in their own uh, separate column, um, cell and column. Genre, uh, we have our histories and audio, two terms for genre in this, in this collection. And again, they stay in their own cell and in their separate columns. So the idea here is to um, standardize our data up as, um, in, the, in a format that's as close as possible to a, um, to a authority file of available through a reconciliation service. And then we are ready to reconcile our, uh, our data. So the um, reconciliation tool we have been using is the very commonly known and widely used um, uh, OpenRefine. And the uh, reconciliation services for this collection was the VF, Library of Congress, uh, Library of Congress Reconciliation Services, and Geonames. Um, now we have our data cleaned, um, standardized, and reconciled. We're ready to make the transformation. Uh, this is the uh, map from Mark Field to DPLA Field. The reason we chose to use DPLA was because we just joined DPLA as a data contributor earlier this year. And we noticed that um, DPLA data model was um, built um, based on European data model, and European data model does facilitate link data, so that's why we chose um, DPLA uh, map for point now. Uh, Richard is going to take over from here, and he's going to give you more details on how he performs the transformation. Okay. All right, so I was going to start out, uh, they always say start out with a joke, so I'm going to come with my standard catchphrase, which gives you some insight into me, but I'll tell you a different self-depreciating joke. So what happens when you forget to open up the IP range on your Amazon instance that's running your test? Nobody can get to it. So I'll fix that, and maybe I'll get to it a little bit later. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so the team started a long time before I got to join. So after I worked on my boss, uh, she did, they did let me, they did invite me to join. But seriously, they were ready to start some invitations, so I needed my help. So I'm a big open source advocate, user, and contributor. So while I did a, a, a simple search for what software I would be using to support the project, uh, after I started catching up on the readings, uh, the team had uh, gathered a lot of uh, education materials, and uh, of course. Uh, but the search is pretty simple. We use a lot of Apache projects, web servers, uh, the application server, and then I use the Commons library. So Apache Geno was really a really simple choice. Uh, so I installed the, the, the endpoint, Fuseki endpoint, uh, which of course included the triple storage, even two. Uh, and then I loaded a bale of turtles I found all over. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, that was given to me. I didn't know that. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, including some of the Library of Congress ones, the subject headings primarily. Uh, but the authority files are nine gigabytes. I didn't have them on my test server. Uh, so next, uh, I had to think about how I wanted to generate the turtles. Uh, again, some of my more of my things. I like to automate everything I can, is what I tell everybody, so people can do the things that need their attention. Uh, before machine learning and stuff and remove their jobs as well. <laughs> so, uh, and then while I'm developing, I, of course, I, you know, I feel a lot of self-induced pressure, so I want to get this done as quickly as possible. But I am looking ahead a little bit, planning, because uh, some of the next step, which we'll talk about in a moment, is integrating this with our repository software. So, uh, to my perspective, the choices were a multi-phase transformation uh, using existing tools or APIs, or uh, you saw the mapping that they created, uh, and then the, you know, access hit transformation or a custom app. And, uh, some of the downsides we found from the transforming, of course, is there's, uh, I, I think it was the, uh, the, the Mets was marked as, the Mets transformation style sheet was marked as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, in process or whatever. Uh, and then some of the tools, you know, just transformed wasn't as clean as we wanted. And then ultimately, you know, the, the group, they ch 
chose, they, only, they didn't want to transform all fields. So uh, ultimately, and then anybody who knows me knows that I would like to develop any time I can. And so uh, given all those factors, I just chose to do the custom map. So my first simple step was, or my next step, simple step, was to take the control, or to take the, the mapping and just turn it into a control document. So uh, one of the things we're also trying to do for some of our, what we like to call bulk loading projects, you know, programmatic loading, uh, is to have a spreadsheet into the Google, in the Google sheet. So I did that here, added a few control fields. Uh, then it made it easier also when we started talking about, uh, we didn't want to, I mean, I didn't want to have a single spreadsheet for every different collection when we do the rest of the or history collections. So that I thought about, oh, well, we can just add a few more fields and do a, uh, a uh, override of an individual field. So true. Uh, for the turtle generation, uh, while I'm boring you with some more detail, I've included some exciting screenshots for you. <laughs> so, uh, because it's the same technology, the, we, the repository we, we use, the SOPXCM, is an open source project. It was started 10 years ago, so uh, it doesn't use some of the newer AFP.net with uh, Razor as the technology and the MVC. But uh, anyway, I, because I wanted to, because that was what I was going to do in the future, I used the same. Google, of course, has a .NET API for sheets. Uh, I did find a library, .NET RDF, uh, which is uh, to use to connect to the triple store. And then uh, I use a, like, you know, many, uh, an iterative type of human process. And in, in my development, uh, I would, you know, make a version. I would run the app after doing some improvements uh, I would be learning more about uh, Turtle, for example. <coughs> and then, uh, so I ran Apache Jetta Riot, another command line tool to validate. Uh, and I did find my own bugs. And uh, for my boss's sake, I'm telling you, yes, I use the root bug. <laughs> uh, so then, uh, so I, once we finalized all that, uh, ran uh, with the authority file that the team provided me, uh, the custom authority file for this collection. I uh, loaded those two together in a new data set. Uh, and then uh, we were ready to go to the next step. So Sparkle, uh, repeating what I said earlier. So uh, this is where we start collaborating as a group. Uh, we used uh, the Fuseki public interface uh, to, do, uh, to do the Developing the queries out of some of the base things that we were learning this all at the same time, so uh, it was easy to use the public interface uh, to live data uh, after do, after learning also from the other uh, the test files I loaded, and then uh, and we, our our goal was to do the subject query first, uh, so we did that as a group and continued the, the collaboration level, and then uh, so that so the there was two apps I wrote. One was the turtle generator, and then the next was uh, the demo app. So, uh, because I always always so want to learn at the same time, so uh, I used the newer, you know, the newer uh, project style for, for the demo app, the web demo app. And then uh, to make it easier on me, uh, trying to continue the model view controller uh, design pattern. Uh, the, we have a, a webmaster and a student assistant, so web team, and uh, they provided the, the HTML styling for me to pop right into uh, the layout. So uh, again, my apologies for my faux pas, for, uh, but there is the URL if you want to save that. And uh, I was joking to Jing, I'll, I'll run out and buy a laptop tonight and get it all fixed. I'll get that fixed for tomorrow uh, if you're interested. So, uh, and uh, try to break it. Uh, <laughs> not. But I worked, we did work hard on it, so uh, it shouldn't have any problem. But uh, anyway, that's uh, so that's that part. So, our future development plans uh, obviously, uh, we only have a creator and a uh, subject search and the browse. Obviously, we need to learn a lot, a lot more sparkle. Uh, we're going to continue.
continue to develop the overall workflow, transforming our metadata uh, to do deflections. Uh, I have some interest in uh, also to not eliminate uh, what the other team members do, but maybe to try to do some uh, some comparison. Uh, you know, at first I thought, well, maybe we will need to query the Library of Congress side to do more to learn. I was talking about learning how uh, OpenRefine does uh, call outs, but I realized, you know, I can just data is available, I'll just load it locally and I can just do uh, queries uh, through uh, the existing uh, the, uh, the .NET RDF. So that's part of my continue to develop the web app and uh, the turtle app. Uh, so the next goal is, uh, so the Pudgeter software has uh, solar-based search. The original search was just, excuse me, was a, uh, it's a database you know, search. And then uh, it was updated to do a solar search. So I see it as just providing another uh, configurable option for users to have uh, integration with the, to use the, uh, you know, to build on top of the, the demo app and just integrate it into the software. So it becomes an option. And then uh, we have a few people who are working on it. So obviously we're working on some grants opportunities. So does anybody have any questions? Or no, we're doing questions. We'll take questions right. for them. Thanks. Thank you. So our next speaker is um, Ruth Tillman from Penn State. Um, I always get the two confused, yeah. so I apologize. <laughs> um, she is the Cataloging Systems and Linked Data Strategist at Penn State University Libraries. She works to improve the library's catalog and discovery systems while exploring opportunities for introducing newer technologies. Her research areas include um, labor and digital libraries and linked data description of special collections and archival resources. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if I can pitch my water bottle without it falling over. Do you want me to hold it? Um, I'll put it on the chair. Okay. Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Ruth Tillman. I'm the Cataloging Systems Link Data Strategist at Penn State University <laughs> Libraries. <laughs> And um, in my presentation, I'm going to be talking about a project that we recently completed with the Association of Religion Data Archives, which is a multi-institution data catalog located through Penn State Social Science Research Institute. I want to highlight two elements of the project. First, I'm going to talk about the process by which I, returned, I turned a request for something somewhat conventional, although surprising, into an opportunity to explore linked data. I saw it as a chance to uh, demonstrate the meaningful work that can be done through cataloging um, outside of our traditional areas. And then I will do a brief walkthrough of the actual ways in which we describe the data sets and the results of the partnership. Um, for that second part, I do want to emphasize that our choices were based on the data available. Um, so in terms of, I'm not saying I'm presenting here the perfect data catalog schema that you can use, but it is one that has worked for us. All right. So first, um, let me start by saying a little more about the artists, since they play a large role in this. Uh, the Association of Religion Data Archives has been making data sets available online for 21 years. It's funded by the Lilly Endowment, the Templeton Foundation, Penn State, and Chapman University, and has partners at other locations. Although the site contains a lot more than data sets, they currently have about 1,000 data sets online, all freely available, that they've collected over the last two decades. The data sets are primarily sociological surveys of religious groups, which have been created by researchers all over the world. It was originally focused on American stuff, but has since expanded. The ARDA team makes these data sets available in formats like Stata, SPSS, ASCII, and Excel. It includes codebooks, and the site has built-in tools so that you can actually do your own data analysis of the existing data. It's really fun to work, play on. So if you're interested, uh, I encourage you to check that part out. All the metadata about the data sets is held in a database and is displayed on the website, which is created as .asp. Again, it is a 21-year-long project. <laughs> um, now, critically, because of the grant funding, the ARDA has a full-time developer in-house. Um, her name was also Ruth, Ruth Christensen. This is the only time that I've ever been the other Ruth on a project, as compared to like, <laughs> you know, three Nathans or two Johns. So, without her tech expertise, this would not have been able to happen. So we'll start with the unusual ask. 
the Arda approached cataloging with the kind of request that makes our hearts go pitter patter, except it's more, it's more like buh, pitter patter, pitter patter. <laughs> because they said, could you create mark records for about a thousand data set records? And we said, yes. <laughs> so we can provide you the data. We have this database. It would be great. Um, their goals made a fair amount of sense. Apparently, their PI had been on WorldCat and realized that none of their data sets were available there, just their white papers. He was doing a little name searching. And what he did find, though, was that uh, ICPSR, the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, to another social science organization, makes all of their records available as MARC for easy download. And they said, well, if they are doing it, we're going to do it too. Um, so he came to us and just said, you know, what do you need? I know a little bit about catalogs. He's a full professor. He's been working for a long time. So he's used to the old school catalogs. What do you need to make these records? Now, um, I didn't just say no to this. Because you know, we are talking about the data. We said yes and. I was fairly new to Penn State when we had this conversation. But I was the faculty liaison for the team that would be doing the work. And so I was facilitating the meetings. I also had to review to see whether the project was even possible or would cause too much work for the department. I mean, a thousand mark records. Could be really easy, could be way too much. So I took this as an opportunity to yes and the proposal. The data that they had could absolutely be turned into some fair, minimal mark records. But as I spent time on their site, I realized that you know there were opportunities to do more. Part of my title is linked data strategist, and one of the harder parts of that is figuring out where linked data is a reasonable and strategic choice for the libraries and not just something fun or not necessarily useful. I mean, fun's good, right? That's, that's like <laughs> experimental research, but for stuff like this. Um, now, if we hadn't had scripting capacity and cataloging, we might have just proposed a schema catalog. We have some excellent people who work very well with XSLT, so we were able to use them. Um, and if they hadn't had a skilled programmer, um, especially given the complexity of their site, we wouldn't have necessarily been able to do this project. I took this as an opportunity in cataloging to consult with them on their own system, which is not something that we will be maintaining in the long run. So this didn't add to our permanent workload, and we didn't really anticipate schema.org would change significantly in how you describe a data set. We're still reviewing and updating it though with them because they've just gotten a partnership that's allowing them now to finally make DOIs without having to pay enormous amounts of money. So we're saying, okay, how would we represent those in these records? And continuing to expand. I think that these kinds of opportunities to augment systems outside of our libraries can be practical opportunities um, that don't add to our own overhead because you know we all have so much to do and not necessarily enough time, but we have some really good um, results. So I'm going to walk through the project a little bit and how we developed the model and then how it's turned out so far. Our first step for both Mark and Schema was to sit down with the developer and the project manager and take a look at their database. Um, we asked for some sample data as XML because it's fairly easy to visually review and walk through, and we could experiment a little with XSLT. As I mentioned, this is a 20 plus year project, and it really was. Um, we had 20 years of data, which was 20 years of user provided data, although the team has done some interventions in cleanup. Uh, fortunately, for example, they had cleaned up all the years to make them a standardized four digits. Um, but there were some inherent limits based on what they had collected and then how they had formatted it. We determined the minimum fields that were shared between all the items and then what was shared between most items. You can do a little um, X query and such to get those kinds of data. The project manager, Gail Johnston Ulmer, then worked with Route C to clean up the fields that just needed a little more standardization. We also evaluated some of the really uncontrolled fields like user-generated keywords for how we might represent them. We did pull those in. But for something like measurement technique, which would have been really great to include for data sets, it was all written out, and there was just no way we could come up with a standardized way to represent it. They might eventually try doing an experiment where they pull it out, derive it, make a separate field, and then we talk again about it, but that's definitely a future problem. Um, so this is an example, for exa uh, example, of the kind of data that you might have in entered. This is um, funder data from one of the data sets. And you see that it's not wrong. Um, obviously, an anonymous Catholic foundation is not necessarily a known institution. It's not great. So when we were going through this, we definitely used name versus legal name. Um, but for the most part, except for that first one, well, actually, that first one might be a full name, right? It's an extremely long one, and it says where it's at. 
that we said, okay, this is good enough data. This is something we can work with. And it does actually um, work out in the end where we ended up querying it. Um, we chose to model the data catalog as data sets pointing with the, term, the phrase uh, schema included in data catalog to the main browse page, which would be then declared to be a data catalog. Um, we could have chosen to do it in an inverse way, linking from the data catalog out to each data set as data set, but that would have been over a thousand links on that browse page, which already has a thousand links, but it would have been a thousand more declared things. So we were concerned about the load on the page, and we were also concerned about whether anybody parsing it would have trouble, um, would, would just stop, right? So we said, okay, we're gonna have each data set point in, especially because that's extensible, right? You add three more data sets, you include your declarations, when Google indexes that page to say, oh, this is a data set, this data set is included in this data catalog. In theory, anybody looking at it, that should understand. Now, I'll do a quick overview of the actual fields we used for the data catalog. The data catalog itself was the only manually generated record of this whole project. Um, as I mentioned, we created them using schema.org. We used the URL as the ID, again, because they didn't have something like a DOI or they could really make a more canonical. Um, we obviously called it a data catalog. We had some discussions about what we wanted to call it because the Association of Religion Data Archives, um, and I think I may have typoed when I put that in there, I think it might just be archive, but it has a lot of different projects on it, so we said, okay, we're gonna call it the surveys, but then we wanted to make sure that like other name forms were represented. Um, the description, the project manager simply wrote that and ran it by the PI. The um, data catalog is much bigger than just the collection of surveys, so we so the data catalog is created by the organization that is the, the ARDA, the Association of Religion Data Archives. We needed to acknowledge everybody who funded the, um, the data, it's very important in representing both the data sets and this, was they said, you know, make sure we represent our funders, make sure you represent their funders. That was a big emphasis, so there were obviously multiple funders, but we, we wrote it out this way. Um, and then for about, we had a lot of discussions over how we should do this. This is what we ended up doing. I'm not wild about it. I'd be interested in hearing if other people have thoughts on vocabulary. But we essentially did some um, LC subjects with an ID named pairing. So social science surveys, for example, is extremely relevant. So that's what the overall data catalog profile looks like. If anyone wants to take a look at that slide later, they are in the drive. So the single item records were all generated from the database. Because the project was in .asp, which I actually know nothing about, but according to Ruth C, the web pages had to be manually regenerated once we set everything up. So she actually had to go through and run a bunch of transformations. That regeneration and review part actually took that team a little bit longer than any of this took us. Um, we didn't manually check all of the things, but there was a lot of spot checking. The single items, again, are in the context of schema. As I mentioned earlier, they don't have DOIs, so we just use the page's um, URL in the ID field. The type is always data set, so we hard-coded that in. The identifier is an identifier, just in case people have to just search for that, or we come up with another use of it. Um, name was generated from the database's title field, included in data catalog, of course, post back to browse. Um, because the ARDA did not create the data sets, we still wanted to represent that these data sets are affiliated with the ARDA beyond associating them with the data catalog in case the record is out sort of in the wild. So we declared them to be the provider of the data sets. We really liked the Wikidata term maintainer or maintained by, um, but there wasn't something like that there. So we said, okay, they're, they're the provider of this site. Um, creators, fortunately, were encoded as simply a string um, people's names, or in this case, institutional names, which is kind of interesting. This particular record that I grabbed was created by a couple of um, institutions, apparently. Um, they were encoded separately so that we could use those both in MARC, where we put them in the 720s, um, because we really couldn't say this was any kind of formalized name thing. We said, okay, <laughs> throw it in. It's a 720. It's close enough. Um, and then we put in funder information for each record. The free text field, this was the easiest to handle. They simply had a descriptive field. We put it in description. We also put that in the 520 in the mark. And then for about, again, we had to figure out what to do with these terms. Um, these are all user-provided terms. We, we thought about doing keyword, which is 
how I'm a separated list. We ended up doing it this way to break them out more. I wouldn't say one's necessarily better than the other, but we really didn't like the idea of sort of smushing them into a comma-separated list, um, so we did it this way. And so this is an overview of the single record profile. About 40% of that is hard-coded data, um, and the rest is supplied by Parsons, the same database that makes the, uh, the, the web pages. Now, everyone involved in the project was really thrilled when, shortly after we finished the work over the summer, Google launched its data set search. We were able to search for records and we found very neat and kind of basic snippets of the data. That funder list earlier <laughs> was another example of one with the lowercase v's and such. The team saw a marked increase in record use and was also contacted by their funder saying, you know, there's this new tool out there where we're able to say, oh no, we're already in it. We don't actually need any more money, we're just awesome. Um, <laughs> so their, their funders were very happy to hear this and they wrote a really nice like, letter about it. Now we still have a few things we'd like to tackle. For example, this should have the PI's names on it, Leland Harder and someone else. Um, and if you search, say, for Leland Harder there, you don't get this data set. Don't know why, encoded as a creator with a name. So we've looked at the, um, the data set model that they provide. We think that we're doing it right, but we're kind of gonna review some of these things. Um, and then, just to sum up, what was the, the overall payoff of this? Um, some of it, it was a good experience for me and for the digital, um, sorry, DAT, digital access team in cataloging. Um, others were less involved in the schema portion, but we were able to show the parallels between our traditional systems and BibFrame and how these, these data sets could be reflected in both, uh, or, or sorry, not BibFrame, in schema. Um, this was also much less complex than doing something like BibFrame, and that's why I used the term syncretism, which is a, a term that's used in religions for bringing together bits of different faith practices. Sometimes you can't convert your whole cataloging department wholesale to BibFrame, but instead you say, hey look, here's a couple of things, right? How do we think about linked data? And honestly, I think that these are some more practical intermediate paths than simply up and converting to, nobody from, no, I was gonna say, Phil's not in the room, right? <laughs> like up and converting to, to BibFrame overnight. Um, I think that this is a more practical way to go. It also helped other people understand our work better because um, we, we were able to say, hey, look, here's all these mark records, right? Do this search in WorldCat, here's what you get. Here, go to the Google Data Set Explorer, here's what you get. And people were able to see those parallels and, you know, see that we're not, like, I think the cataloging is the backbone of the library. Not everybody remembers that. Um, and it was a good opportunity to just communicate on campus, too, to the kinds of things we could do. Uh, the PI is really great. He was very vocal about how helpful the libraries have been. So we found ourselves a real advocate in that. And then possible reusability. Right now we've got this schema, we could certainly evaluate others' data. If it, they were running something like WordPress, for example, I have my own schema data in my own WordPress thing. I could easily make that happen. Um, I can't do something as complicated as ASP. So we have these opportunities where even we might be able to reach out to other people on campus and say, hey, we see this, we see the software you're running, and either if you have a program where we could do this, or if you're using WordPress, we actually know how to, that works. Um, so there's, I think, a lot more possibilities. We're actually looking now at what we might do to move that data as well to represent those data sets in Wikidata. Because why not? <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of an overview of how we did both um, an attempt to do something different than you know, the basics that we were asked for and, and show what linked data can actually do. And I think it's um, turned out really well for us. We'll take questions. So does anybody have any questions about either presentation? They were really good presentations, really interesting um, perspectives. Not one. Yes, I have questions. <laughs> so um, I totally agree that cataloging is a backbone for library that is underappreciated sometimes. I was wondering, um, you know, in my library, which is Notre Dame, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I get where well, we get sometimes pushback from catalogers who've been in the job a really long time and just think it's different. Like they think they don't have the skill set to do it, and then mm -hmm. I think there's maybe the intimidation and also like you know not wanting to change. Do you have any experience with that? I would say start with Lisa and Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, no. Um, I think in the yes and no. I think that um, one of the the big things is to, um, rather than say like it's a linked data project, just sort of say, like 
we're creating these brief records, we need to think about what the what the fields are, right, that are important for discovery. So just like we think about what the important mark fields are, um, what are these, and then just saying, okay, essentially we're just mapping them to these fields. So in some ways it's more like you work on the, the schema part, they work on the data part, and then you come back and say, look, look at this outcome. Together we did all of this, and that's more, that helps people see that what they can do is, um, is easier. I think actually I'm gonna cite uh, Dan Scott and Stacey Allison Casson, I'm not sure if she's in the room here, but she is here. They talked about some stuff with um, catalogers updating Wikidata and showing how those updates went into real time sort of changes to things. And I think that that is in the Lib Journal a few issues ago. And I think that kind of demonstration shows how you can show somebody how basic stuff that they always do can become really actionable. Any other questions? So you created uh, mark records and some other kind of records side by side? Uh, we actually, well, we, we created the stuff for the, we did create all the mark records ourselves, um, like XSLT, um, the digital access team and I worked on that. We worked on what the template would be for the mark. We worked out what the um, XSLT would be doing. And then we created also a schema.org template, but the actual data part of that was used, was primarily done by the programmers. Um, we really agree with the So they were exported from that database. Yeah. Obviously, the ARDA has to have its own maintenance plan for its own site. Um, the, the, one of our goals was to essentially code it in so that it would simply be every time they generate a new web page, this is generated as part of it. So um, there are some maintenance questions about if we want to change up what the schema looks like, how we would update that. The maintenance of the mark is actually trickier because essentially they're sending us the mark every six months, all their new records every six months. Actually, all their ads updates and deletes every six months um, in a classic way and we're doing those. So that actually is a lot more maintenance work than the like data part of it where once the web portion is built, it's up to them to maintain it, but they've been maintaining this for 21 years so they do have a decent track record. So can I ask a question? Is there, I can ask a question, follow myself. <laughs> I'm asking a question. Um, so did you, what about, um, so I have a couple of questions actually. So your data model is really simple. Yeah. Um, and did you, did you, I, I work in LM on, on data sets and, and we're looking, now we're trying to model biomedical data sets. Um, so, so one question would be, did you look at any other, obviously yours is really simple, but did you go out and do some research on data models for data sets that were available besides schema.org? Um, for the most part, we didn't at that point. This was, I guess, also a year and a half ago, and so I think there was, it wasn't that there was less, but it was harder to sort of find what people were doing this it. But you know, we mostly just looked at the schema.org model and what they were, sort of what they had, and then worked on that. But we, we did kind of do some retro after stuff where we started looking at other people's things. So like download links would be lovely to have, but that's kind of weird right now with how the data's modeled again. Okay, and, and are these data sets static? So do you have any, any um, need, or have you thought about the need for any kind of versioning? Uh, the data sets are pretty much static. That is a thing that we talked a bit about. Um, they just, yeah, that's a, that's sort of a policy thing on their end, but normally it's people have completed a data set project and then, you know, some of these date back to, well, the 80s and such. Um, and, and so, and the distribution is basically via web page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> set of download links for the different formats that they do. Most of the work internal has been for them to make different forms of the thing and then validate those. So I have a question for you too, Shane. Um, so I, I thought it was interesting, so you used DPLA uh -huh. as, your, as your model, um, and it is based on European, but it's different. So yeah. was there a reason, did you consider at some point using Europeana instead of um, DPLA? Okay. Yeah, we chose uh, DPLA straightforward only because um, um, we um, we think that DPLA is promising. It's it's aggregating everything um, in this country, uh, everything um, every, um, cultural heritage um, in this country. So we thought, you know, it's locally grown, and we're here. It's kind of there is a natural connection there. So yeah, we didn't. Really <laughs> I, have, I have a question about that. Actually, are you 
exporting XML of the type that would go to DTLA as well, or? No. Or you, okay. No, I don't think so. Um, we, um, I, was, I was talking about the data. How would like the harvester help? Yeah, they harvest directly OAI. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're generating an OAI now. Right. Are there any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, everyone, yeah, see everyone's face. <laughs> About the you know the exact matches for the URI lookup because you know that would eliminate and just leave them the set of ones that are done. Right. And also for the pilot project, so the students have done the um, the style sheets for the uh, website, so they probably have a little student component there. Oh. Um. The uh, the Arda has a couple of and these are really at the graduate level. They have a the data, you know, because graduate students are generally interested in data set stuff. So I've met with a couple over the that they, two that they've had so far and talked with them about some of the things. Um, the most recent one I got to introduce to Mark, which was a very exciting. He, he's going to be sending an email to a bunch of social science people trying to explain what the Mark download files are. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, please help, I don't know anything about Mark. And so we came to my office for half an hour and we talked to Mark. But um, in terms of what, what there is, I think it's mostly helping people understand how you might places you might share data sets. So that's, it's really, again, most of the grad students really are that, but I think there has been some understanding of like where you can look online for data sets and how you might think about, also how you might think about collecting the data in the future in a way that's more structured, right? Like more granular, more structured. You could do more if the data had been collected differently. So Ruth, did you say, did I miss this? Did you say that um, they're taking that schema.org Data that you're creating, are they um, are they dropping that into their web pages? Yeah, it's embedded in the XML um, as JSON LD. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think I mentioned it exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, Sergio, can I ask you a question too about the my own question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, ju I'm just curious. So you you said that you're downloading the. Um, um, Data from ib.loft.gov or the LC? Yeah, whatever the library, yeah, the Library of Congress. Uh, so how often, so that changes, yeah. right? And and they, and I think, at least ib.loft.gov, I think, I think refreshes every night. Um, so how are you dealing then with, with your data if you're downloading that becomes out of date rather than direct querying to LC? Well, that was, uh, I mean, that's just, to me, that's just a simple automation with, with batch script potential job, but it works the same way in regards to, uh, I would have mentioned that, of course it's not, I envision that it's always going to be the, you know, the cataloger is going to create a new record uh, and to 
besides the, the, the exact matching part, you're still going to have to use the, the existing staff interface in the repository, and then it'll update the, you know, the triple store instead of, you know, I don't envision that we're going to have any kind of process that would, you know, do a Sparkle query to update the triple store directly. To me, that's not practical. So I just see them all as part of the maintenance. But so some systems have headings have changed for quite some time. I mean. Yeah, I'm just curious if that was yeah. something that you guys were thinking about. Automation. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, well let's thank our speakers.